Je crois en Dieu le Père tout puissant, Créa de du ciel, de la terre, de Jésus tout son fils Seigneur, notre Seigneur qui a été conçu du Saint-Esprit, Père de la Vierge de Marie et de son Dieu aux enfants, d'où je me dis je le vivre de la mort. Je crois au Saint-Esprit, à ce Jésus Saint-Esprit, la communauté de la résurrection, à ce la vie éternelle. Amen. Back again, pour le Prince Aid, here to shoot this documentary. Hopefully this documentary will give you an insight into the ancient movement, especially from an Almeyer perspective. This is a tradition that's been in my family for 70 years. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this documentary. Let's get to action. Well, I can't begin any of, talk about any of the law without beginning with this guy here. Well, I know it may look different to a lot of people in the Western world, but this here is the tree for Legba. This is where we serve Legba. Uh, I know everybody's used to seeing uh, Veve, some people are used to seeing St. Lazarus, but this is where we make our offerings to Legba, this tree right here, you know? I don't know the name of it in English, but c'est en pied sirène, we say in Creole itself, you know? So this guy here, this is Legba. He is the god, or the god, what do you say, god, not god, you know, not like the English god, but god as in the guard of the Laku. You know, he guards this area, this whole general area itself, you know, this uh, this yard. Um, yeah, so this is Legba here, you know, this is our Legba. We feed this tree, we make offerings here, you know. I'm definitely going to take you to where we make our offerings for the the the, the cockpit, or the four, uh, the four, um, the four owners. Right here, before we do anything in this yard here, we serve what you call the four mets or cock met. You have the owner of wood, the owner of death, the owner of crossroads, and you have the owner of water. So before we do anything, what we usually do is that uh, we basically dig holes and we basically, you know, light what we ever we need to light. You know, afterwards we're done, we brush everything for food, whether it's the food, whatever, and we brush it in the holes we dug. And that is our um, way of connecting with the four owners, uh, the four owners itself, you know. So this is how our family does it, you know. Um, before we do anything, we make sure we take care of them and then we move on with the rest of the rituals itself, you know. I mean, some people say Legba comes first, but in this Laku, this is how we do it itself, you know. The four Mets, the four owners first, and then we move in to everyone else itself, you know. That's how we Elmiras do it in this Laku. Laku, la see it. Well, the first room we're going to enter into is Bosu's room. Just like uh, any person in our family, we treat the Lua with respect, you know. Um, basically, this is a ritual which we usually do. Uh, before we enter into any room, we always knock on the door out of respect for the Lua. So, we're going to take you into Bosu's room and uh, pretty much you can see, you know, how we, you know, where we work at, you know, when we're, when we're basically petitioning them. When we're making big ceremonies. Well, as you can see, this is a room for Bosu. You can pretty much see the horns here of a bull. Um, you can see that on the floor. This here is pretty much the horns of a bull itself. Um, we do our rituals in here for Bosu. For people who don't know Bosu, there's a um, Bosu is basically represented as bull. Um, he is a strong force that removes opposition from our lives. You know, um, there's many aspects. There's a couple of aspects of Bosu. There's Bosu Tuakon. You know, there's Bosu uh, Jabalo Bosu, as many knows whatsoever. Um, so this room here is basically to Mr. Busu itself, you know, there really is an aspect for him, you know, um, like here is just Busu, you know, I know as I just said, there's many, there's like a couple aspects that I just mentioned itself, so this is just for like Busu, playing Busu itself, you know, so we're going to move along to our 
next to the chamber. And uh, stay tuned. Yes, this year is a shrine for Ezri Donto and Ogu Ferrari. In our family, we marry them together. And when I say marry, we basically found that these are, this is a harmonious blend. You know, so you can have them together and you know, the energies will work hard, like harmoniously without any conflict. So those of you who know of um, Ifa, you know not to mix Shango up with Ogu, the Ogun, because they're going to conflict, they're going to fight. So this year, you know, we know for generations that for decades, that this, is all, this is what worked for our family and it worked very well, you know? So that's why we have the photos together. Um, again, this is stuff that, you know, these here were left, you know, like the photos were pretty much left for my grandfather. So uh, nothing's going to change, you know, and you can pretty much see his Catholic, you know, the Catholic influence here um, that he left behind. You know, so this is the way he did it, and this is the way it's going to continue to be done. In the West, I know I do my things a little different, and I have a different opinion about the way things are supposed to be done. But hey, this is the way my old man used to do it. You know, my old, older man, whatsoever, you know. And this is what he left behind, and this is the tradition that will continue in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I will take you to the next shrine. Well, here we come to the shrine of La Reine Ezerly. I know many people know about uh, Ezerly Freda, Ezerly Daume, Ezerly uh, Gun. Um, there's many aspects, but in our in our family, this is uh, La Reine Ezerly, and next to her is Saint Jacques. Yup. Saint Jacques. I know in the Western world they use Saint Jacques. Sometimes they use Saint Jacques as Ogu Ferrai itself, you know, but for us we just use it as Saint Jacques and this is La Reine Ezuli, you know. This is how our family used to do it. Um, you know, my grandfather used to do it and this stuff has been here since, you know, you know, since he was alive, you know. Um, you can pretty much see her drinks and stuff like that. Pretty much stuff that has been updated, you know, with my uncle himself. Um, but this is her shrine. This is this belongs to her. Everything on this altar belongs to her. Um, with that said, uh, I'm going to move on to the next room now. Yes, here again, next room. This room here, I think many people have an idea. They've seen the Veves many a times, you know. Um, this year, as you can see, it's a cross, and you can pretty much see what they see as a represent. What you see as a representation um, in the uh, in the Veves, you see like this big, yeah, I guess this this base, and then you see a cross. This is uh, this is where we worship Bawa La Croix, you know. Some people say Bawa Samzi, but to us, it's Bawa La Croix because Bawa La Croix is basically, the, you know, his color is. You know, black and uh, the cross represents is what he represents itself. You know, um, in voodoo, many say he's a judge of the dead. You know, uh, if you listen to Wawa, you heard of this song "Bawa Bom Jesus." You know, "Bawa La Croix Bom Jesus." I believe there's a song in Wawa. You know, "Racine La Wa." You know, he actually sings that itself. So, in in voodoo tradition, "Bawa La Croix" is considered, you know, amongst voodooism. As the judge of the dead, you know, where Bawa Samzi is considered as the god of the dead, but you know, different places they may say Bawa Lakwa and Bawa Samzi is one and the same. So, this is uh, this is it for this room here. We're gonna move on to the next room. Well, we're in the ancestral chamber here. There's a couple of loa here. Uh, I will just give you a detail for here, um, so you can see. This here is pretty much uh, this movie here. In America, we call them urns and stuff, but this doesn't have like dirt in here whatsoever. They didn't really in they didn't disintegrate anyone whatsoever. This is a this is um. Well, this here is the movie of my grandfather. You know, 
in the voodoo we have a thing called Elixir Loana Tet Muna. You know, so we could pretty much say that my grandfather, they, he had, they, they removed the, the law from his head. So you could pretty much say, you know, in various ways that his spirit rests within his Guvi itself, you know. Um, yeah, the spirit that was with him pretty much rests in here. So you could pretty much say that part of him, all that is in the mixture here. Um, and these are the, the, the spirits of various other people who passed on before my grandfather. You know, um, and they did that ritual, and they put them all in here. So all these people are pretty much ancestral spirits itself, you know, people that's in the family whatsoever, generations ago, you know? Yeah, so this is a long history we're talking about, you know? Um, yeah, I want to bring you guys in here uh, a bit. This here... Many people may know him as Cousin. Well, this is Makut Cousin. You know, I don't really work. I don't. Well, actually, I don't work with uh, Cousin at all. Period. This is thing. This is a lot that you know goes back generations. My grandfather used to serve itself, and you know, my uncles. My uncle serves itself. Um, yeah, I don't really know too much about him, but this is the law that my uncle serves. Um, yeah, and I'm going to show you here. The camera's not adjusted yet. But I will adjust it, you know, so you can actually see in a bit. Um, you can see remnants of things that belong to Ogu here because we, pre we pretty much do rituals for Ogu in this room, you know, to the side. And uh, we do things for Kuzin in here. So I'm going to tilt it down so you can actually see. Well, this year belongs to Ogu Ferrari. You know, the color red. You know, you know, pretty much in the machete itself, this belongs to Ogu Ferai. So in this room here also, we pretty much uh, take care of Ogu Ferai as well. You know, very hot spirit. And uh, again, I made a re video recently about Ogu Ferai is definitely underrated in the United States. Um, very powerful Lua. Um, so, we'll move on to the next room. Yes. Well, this is the ancestral room of my grandmother. Ancestors on my grandmother's side, pretty much on my dad's side, you know. I mean, let me, let me say that again. Basically, this room here is on uh, my grandmother on my father's side. And this is pretty much the Guvis, pretty much that house, the, the spirits of my ancestors on my grandmother's side. So you can pretty much see all these here. These are Guvis, you know, they house the spirits of, you know, my ancestors on my grandmother's side, you know. Oh, my grandmother, the name was uh, Carmen Dizel. Um, and uh, I didn't mention my grandfather's name, and I'll definitely mention it now. Um, his name was uh, Silvia Elmira. It's a long story behind the name Elmira. You know, it's kind of a funny story too. Well, basically, uh, we're actually supposed to be named Pierre, um, for what I was told from an uncle of mine. It was, a, it was a time where he had to have his birth certificate and he couldn't find his birth certificate. So they didn't know what to, you know, name to give him. So what my grandfather did was chose the name of his grandfather who was from Cuba, you know? Um, and that's where he took the L name Elmira from. So, um, with that, that's how we became Elmira. So, uh, we're going to move on to the next room. We'll talk, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, other loa. Alright. <laughs> Yep. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was uh, a family member singing. Um, well, this room here. <laughs> well, So I'm going to take you in here. Again, let's follow the ritual. So if you ever come to Haiti and uh, you 
basically coming to a lock room. If you're going to enter a room, remember, you knock. Pretty much, this is the uh, this is uh, the shrine for where we worship or serve uh, Metagwe and Simbi on the zoo. So you can pretty much see this is a basin or basin. We fill up with water and stuff, you know. Sometimes we depose food, you know. But yes, this is uh, where we hold the rituals for Simbi on the zoo and uh Agwe, this room here um mm -hmm. <sighs> man it's hot out here <laughs> but um other than that i guess this concludes this part of uh this documentary um yes we got other places to go um stay tuned Yeah, pretty much here. Uh, this is La uh, Grande Cimetière in Port-au-Prince. Pretty much the most, uh, you could say, uh, very revered spot for like Gué de Loi of the Dead. Um, this here, as you can see, is pretty much the tree of Mapillon. Some people call it Gun Mapillon. Some people say it's another aspect of Ezra Lee, like uh, another aspect of Ezra Lee. But other than that, but this is Gun Mapillon. It's pretty much the uh, cemetery for all the uh, pretty much Gede Loa itself. If you're within that family, you're go we're gonna go through Baon. He's gonna walk you through. And a little bit about the area. Um, definitely gotta make sure you got you guys see how they actually do burials in Haiti, which is different from a lot of burials that you actually see in the US because everything is on slab. So I'm gonna take you a depiction of that. But so you have a depiction of this. This is pretty much the shrine for Mapillon, Grand Mapillon. So, uh, yep, hope you see it. Take a couple of photos and uh, definitely we'll have something to show. All right. Yeah, pretty much as you can see, you can take a look around here. This, for you guys that are in the hoodoo, it's a big difference. You're not going to find the dirt from people's grave out here. You can think of taking from their grave, but as you can see, everything is cemented. So if you're talking about coffins, breaking into people's coffins, you're not going to be able to do that. Everything's on stone. Everything around here, you won't find any dirt whatsoever to basically pull from someone's grave. Everybody's cemented. So, I would say this. When it comes down to the whole concept of zombification, it's not happening that easy itself. Because the thing is, everything's under, like, everything's under dirt, and not even, not, not even just that. It's basically casted with, like, cement itself. So, no access itself. So, once you're dead, you're dead for real. And you're not coming out. So, uh... Other than that, we're going to move to the Shrine of Bawang. Um, from there on, that's what we're about to do. Pretty much here at the Shrine of Bawang. Uh, in Haiti, we, I know in the U.S. we actually see a base. When we look at the Veve, there's a base right here. This is a stone base itself. So when you see the Veve, this is a representation of it. And then you have the cross. So in the U.S., this is what we have. And you may see goats walking around. That's because the goats is actually a sacred town. That's when they get it. That's why they have them around here. But um, as far as the, the, the uh, shrine, this is it here. So if you come to like Lansing and in Port Prince, this is where you'll find it. This shrine here is a shrine of Kundalini. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of us see a lot of uh, pictures of her, and uh, you know, we see a lot of bebes of her. We haven't really seen a shrine. Yes, of this is at uh, my country. Oh, yeah, bye. Many people in America have heard of another aspect of Bawo. This is Bawo Criminel. You can pretty much see it. 
this is a shrine, and you can pretty much see the death spot. So when you got enemies, people come here in the community to make their petition towards Bawon Criminelli. So uh, this is as already, someone has already done their ritual, you know, for Bawon Criminelli to take care of their enemies. It's up. So uh, this is what I got here. Um, so this year, uh, as someone has made their um, offering or their petition, what we call it, Creole Pink Limon. So the person was, uh, well, the person had a lot of enemies, so I guess the person came here to take care of, you know, their business. You know, and that's what we call it, taking care of your business in, uh, in our country, in my country. Well, uh, this part of the video is going to be about uh, violence in Haiti. As you can definitely see, pretty much I'm holding this. Um, because there's a lot of violence here, you never know. You know, you definitely got to have some type of protection being in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. You know, uh, I would definitely say if you're coming as a visitor, people may think that, okay, you got a lot of money. So, I mean, I like I, my family has experienced uh, kidnappings, rants for ransom. So it becomes something where you got to have some form of protection, you know. I mean, some people say, "What about you know the spirits that you work with? You know, you're 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 into you're into magic. You're a more core. Why does this protect you? No, the thing you have the thing you have to understand is that there's a balance between spirit and physicality. So the thing is, if you you know you can't just rely on spirit without having the backings of. Uh, of the material world itself, you know, that's how the spirit works through. So, I mean, you know, when you live in Haiti, you, you, you know, you learn of a practical voodoo. It's not something where it is, oh, just this pie in the sky theory, you know, it's something that is balanced, you know, you have the physical world that's addressed as well as the spirit world addressed. But as far as uh, violence goes in this country, if you're in the wrong place, you know, definitely, you'll definitely have some problems, you know. The best thing I could recommend if you're coming into Haiti, you definitely want to have like a uh, um, some, I guess, uh, you, you definitely don't want to roll by yourself, you want to roll with fa people that you know, family, if you can get a bodyguard out here, that would be a good thing, you know, you just can't come out here blind and just figure you're just going to run, like, walk into certain neighborhoods, likelihood people are going to look at you the way you look, you don't look like the area, so you'll definitely have some problems, so, I mean, I, I definitely will talk about, you know, um, I'm definitely going to talk about uh, an assassination attempt. I'm going to, you know, the car is not here, so the car is going to be pulling up soon. Well, the van, you know, I guess the SUV is going to be pulling up soon. It was an assassination attempt that happened a while ago. So I'm definitely going to bring you to that. But living in this country, you got to have one of these. You can't live here without having one of them, especially if you're a person that has status or your name is well known. Port au Prince, you definitely, uh, you definitely can't be a weakling out here, you know? Um, when you're in Port-au-Prince, you definitely gotta be a tough, you, you gotta be tough. You can't be weak. See, if you're going to like live in a hotel, and you know, you're going to live in a hotel when you come down here, that's not really, that's not really nothing, you know? Until you living out here, you're getting your foot down on the dirt, on the broken, on a broken slab, on a broken pavement itself you know you really won't experience you really won't have that much experience you know I mean for me again this is a thing I've been you know I've been in and out of Port-au-Prince I lived down here when I was a kid um, back here again you know it's just something that you just got to be a person that commands respect you know when you're out here you can't just be flaunting around like you know you, you're cool with everybody you know just like the United States you know in, in the black community it's the same way but only here you never know yes People will look kind, but it's easier to be deceived out here by uh, by the kindness itself. You know, everybody's smiling out here. Unlike the United States, you, you definitely got people that will let you know that they don't like you just by the way they look, you know, especially in the black community. Here, it's a little different where people will smile on your face and they'll be the same one to plot your demise. You know, it's really crazy out here, you know. Um, but again, you got to be strong. You definitely got to be a person that's respected, you know, and you got to be stern. You know, you got to be that way. People got to know you don't fuck around, you know, period. You know, um, that's just the way it is. I mean, there's other people that got their approach, but when you're talking about the Elmira family, you don't fuck around, period. We don't, you know. Um, 
that's what I have to say. Um, yeah, as I was telling you before about violence down here, I'm just gonna give you a, like a, a quick, a quick uh, run through about how real this stuff can get down here. So when I'm talking about a lot of things I do say whatsoever, I just wanna show you from uh, experience, from like up close and personal shock and evidence and give you guys evidence. Now, we know in the United States when you know you see car drive-bys, they usually have like a long object that goes into like bullet holes itself. So I'm gonna, I'm, I, I'm gonna direct your eyes itself. This is actually an assassination attempt that was uh, done on someone close, to, like someone in my family. And I just want to show you from here this angle. Now, basically, they was riding through a town, and basically, it was like gunmen. And they basically tried to, you know, kill, you know, kill a passenger, or whomever. Who knows if it was a setup whatsoever? I don't know. It could be that they happened to go in a bad place itself. Um, basically, you had guy come out of nowhere and shoot. Now, let me look, let me let you see how how lucky this person was. But we know in our tradition there is no luck. You know, see. If you follow the bullet passage, you went through, the bullet came through here, and you can see, I'm gonna leave this wood in here, and maybe I'll give you a, up, like a close up, so you can actually see the direction of the bullet. The direction of the bullet came straight through here. Now, if I'm in a passenger side, this is my, uh, this is side my heart's on. Oh, door is locked. Uh, let's see if I can get it through the other side. So if I'm sitting in the passenger side and you check the direction of the bullet, if the bullet came through here, likelihood it would penetrate my lungs or catch my heart. So, letting you know, real deal experience when you come down to Port of Prince. And if you think that you're, uh, if you think that you're a tough guy, I definitely say uh, don't try it out here. What is Haitian voodoo? Well, Haitian voodoo is definitely a practice that originates in Africa. Um, Haitian voodoo, you could say, is more of like a, a Benin tradition that originates from that region, Benin. But back then, it was like that region, you could say, Kingdom of Daume, you know, Tugo, those places and stuff. They no longer call that, you know, like, uh, there's no longer called that. Today, you could say that region is called Benin. But, you know, when you talk about Haitian voodoo, it's definitely different from African African voodoo. Yes, it originated there, but, you know, some of the origin, you know, a lot of people from Haiti, you know, say their origins from that region. But you say that Haitian voodoo is a mixture of various other traditions. So, you know, like you say, Nagu, you know, you say uh, Kongu. You know, these are basically the rites that we have in voodoo came from people from that region. So we definitely have parts of Congo tradition in, in voodoo, parts of... Uh, uh, Nigerian tradition in voodoo, um, parts of Benin tradition in voodoo, but you would say voodoo evolved in a sense where it became something that took its own position in Haiti, where it took on some concepts of Catholicism, it took on some con con concepts of occultism, uh, you know, uh, European occultism, Kabbalah itself. I mean, if you're talking from a Western, like in a Western world, when we talk about Haitian voodoo, it's not really the same as it is in Haiti. You find more people, more of like independent, what you'd call Wunga Makut, you know, where it's more of a sense of people do their own thing, you know, not being necessarily part of a community, which is like glorified, like glorified over there in the Western world. But Haitian voodoo itself is uh, really a practice of ancestral veneration as well as veneration of saints. Now when I say saints, it's not necessarily the Catholic saints itself. You know, this was just a guise that Africans used during the time of slavery to continue their practice of, you know, revering, you know, uh, powerful people of their African tradition. You know, some spirits we have in Voodoo originated in Haiti itself, you know. Now, the thing about that, you know, sometimes people say, what do you mean by originate Haiti? Some of them originate Af Africa. You know, these spirits originate in Africa. Some of them did originate in Haiti, meaning that they were born in Haiti, and after they died, they became uh, 
uh, revered or deified. So, then there has, there's the other aspect of Hindu, which is more of the different aspects they found in Haiti. Some of these aspects are not found in Africa. It is basically something that is only found in Haiti, you know? So you won't find Legba, no, Legba Met Kafu in some African traditions itself, you know? You, you know, you won't find certain cast, like aspects like or guys like Baon Samzi in African traditions. Yes, there is gods of death in other African traditions, but in the Haitian aspect, in the Haitian tradition, it is Baon. So, but uh, when we're talking about Haitian voodoo itself, it is something that took a, a, a turn for its, for its own. You know, um, practice of you know Haitian people, uh, it is definitely different from what you have in the Western world. In the Western world, there's a glorification of zombies and painting your face and all this death stuff, you know. And it's more than that, you know. It's like a person who goes to church. A person goes to church, they praise God, you know. And basically, you know, like you say, your, ble your praises go up, your blessings come down. So it's the same way in voodoo where we make our offerings. Our offerings is our way of praising God, you know. Yes, they may be through intercessors, but these are what you would say are aspects or faces of God, you know, incarnated in a form of people or deceased, you know, deceased loved ones or deceased great people itself, you know. God is in everything. In voodoo, God is not just something that's isolated into a one world. I mean, it's like God is in everything, everywhere you go. You know, it's not something that is just something where you say it is just one place one thing it is a broad it is a broad force that is constant like that is concentrated in everything from the rock the stone the river the air the water the fire you know human beings animals you know so it is something where when we make our offerings it's not just you know to a spirit itself you know it is our way of connecting with the spirit as an intercessor to god you know so that is my take on Haitian food. <laughs> <sighs> Can anyone be initiated into Haitian Buddha? I would definitely say it all depends on what house you come from, meaning what Laku you're part of, what society you're part of, itself, you know. Um, definitely, it, it's not supposed to be for everyone. Um, it all depends on what Laku you go to. I know in the United States, anyone can join with like money, but when you're coming into the country, there's definitely a, a, a wall of silence behind uh, who can be initiated, who cannot be initiated. You know, basically it's like uh, something that's very sacred. Um, look at it like this, is that the tradition, it is a religious tradition as well as it is a way of life. As well, it can be turned into a weapon, you know, so imagine the weapon at imagine it being turned into a weapon how much power a person will wield how much power a person will have in their hand now to give that to anyone that's like that's like you know you, you, you that's like erroneous because you know that person is going to use that power for the wrong purposes itself you know for the wrong purpose or cause so that's why it is definitely monitored a person is monitored who is able to learn and who is not able to learn, you know? Um, it all depends on your character and who you are, you know? Um, but that's what I, I, I could say about that, you know, um, about, you know, that question. But as far as uh, uh, initiation, I want to say this, is that initiation, it is like today in the West, anybody, anyone with money can just pop up and be like, you know what, I want a Kunzo or I want to, to get console or whatever anyone can do that you know um this is like yeah you, know, you know i don't know you know what community these people come from but it's just something that hmm that is definitely frowned upon in haiti itself you know a lot of these you know these voodoo practices in the western world i can say that you know if you use the the the, the standard from which we have in haiti you know you definitely say that these people went in air they went astray from you know the way we actually have it laid down here itself you know like that tradition is something that's supposed to be sacred that's supposed to be safe for either people in your family or you know people that you feel that is worthy of that when you talk about initiation back in the past where the view on initiation back then 
You know, it was like, you know what? You had to do very crazy things to prove yourself, you know? And it just had to be something about you that the person saw interest in to basically be able to teach you the tradition. Now it's like a, a money cause where anyone can get into it, you know? Well, uh, Kut Pud. <laughs> that is a very funny topic to me. Because uh, it is something that, you know, many Westerners know of in hoodoo. Uh, it is basically called goofering. Um, well, the difference between that and Haitian goofering or um, goop, 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 is that that is more of uh, something that you could say that is mixed with toxins, poisons itself, you know. Um, when, when you're talking about in the Western world, it is something that you could say graveyard dirt mixed with, with sulfur or whatever, you know. Um, but over here, it's like toxins, you know. So when you hit it, the intent is basically either to maim you or kill you. So, or you could say, if you want to talk about zombification, you can look at it in that light as well. But uh, today, you can mainly say that a lot of that is more of like main to kill itself. So, goofering is uh, something that is like, uh, well, good food is basically something that's meant to harm your enemy. Most likely to kill them whatsoever, you know. Um, Recently we had a situation where someone uh, actually was a victim of that. A uh, person walked through their house and uh, for some kind of reason, I guess, they happened to ingest something that was sent to them whatsoever and uh, they fell ill after eating it, you know? Um, that stuff happens here, you know? It's like, uh, yes, I talked about violence in Haiti. Um, this is another form of violence in Haiti, you know? Um, that's that's just the way it is down here. Poverty in Haiti is real. It is not like poverty in the U U.S. where, you know, you you know you don't have and you're supplied with like welfare. There is no welfare in this country. It's either you're going to basically find something to do, or else, you know, or else you're going to starve. You know, that's just the way it is down here. You know. You really got to. Down here, you see people hustle everything to make ends meet, you know? I mean, from old shoes, from old shoes to like old tools, anything that people can find. Down here, everybody is trying to make it, you know? Everybody's trying to make it. That's just the nature of this country. Poverty is very real. People have the capacity to work and there's no jobs for them. So it's like uh, people find a means to do whatever they got, they, they got to do. When you walk through Port au Prince, you see some of the, you know, you see some of the most hardest working people out here. You know, like when you when you see people out here, you see people uh, uh, basically struggling. You you can see a person carrying like a, uh, I can't even, I don't even have a word for it, but we call them bullets. It's like a big object, like I'd say, like a long object that people carry in wheels, and sometimes they load it up with a lot of blocks. So you can see one man sweating, barefooted, running through hot. Uh, hot pavement, you know, with this big, long, wooden, like, uh, wooden, uh, I, I don't even know the, ling ling the term for it, you know, but it's like a big wooden object that's like, uh, like, a, uh, that's used to, like, carry, uh, material, and they're running through the streets with it and stuff, you know, um, and that's just showing you the, the type of things that people put themselves through to, uh, make ends meet. It's very sad, you know, because, uh, with, with people working that hard, you say to yourself, where is this getting them? You know, everybody's survive. Everybody's working to survive by the day out here. You know, uh, I would say he is, huh? I would say it's a community tradition. Uh, you can't have a you can't have food without having a community. When you think of the ceremonies in voodoo, you see, uh, I would say, speaking from a Haitian perspective, or from a Haitian, well, speaking from a Haitian point of view, voodoo is a community effort. You can't have a voodoo ceremony without having a community. If the community comes together to make the, to make the ritual or ceremony possible, you know? Uh, when you think of the offerings or the sacrifices that are made, uh, un, you know, unlike how, unlike like the Western thought of, we sacrifice animals and just get discard the animals. You can say that is 
no different from uh, butchering and then preparing the meat for food. You know, we take part of uh, our food, uh, our our meat, and we make it as an offering. You know, we have a saying, you know, which means that people don't eat before the spirit itself. So when we make our offerings or we make our sacrifice, they have their share, and then we have ours. So when we say uh, we do, I mean it's we have this Hollywood perspective of uh, people with uh, paint on their faces, uh, you know, people sticking people with uh, dolls with needles and stuff like that. That is really Hollywood. That's really Hollywood fiction. You know, when you're in Port-au-Prince, you see hate the Haitian voodoo as very different from what you see in the movies, especially Hollywood, because you see it as a, a poor country and you see in this poverty, the people still have light in their lives because you can say that they're peptitioning. You know, if you want to talk from a Catholic perspective, it is as though, as well as it being a community effort, you can see it as a religious effort as well because this is where people find their redemption. This is where people lay their problems. You know, uh, it is no different at, different from a church. You know, when you go to church, you pray. You know, it's just a different way of us communicating with God. You know, so there's a lot of views as though, you know, there is this and there is that. And, you know, there's more than one God. Every Hulu Mizan knows that there is one God who manifests, who manifests in many ways. You know, we can see God in nature. You know, we can see him in human beings. We can see him in animals. We can, you know, we can see him in the air we breathe. You know, it's uh, it's definitely something that God is not outside of his creation. You know, God is in his creation. It's through his creation that we find his power. You know, uh, even though we may have the ter we may have terms like, uh, well, not terms, but we have statements that Montreal Travail, it is because we don't have a mystery God. We don't have a God which we uh, do not see as in active in our lives. God is active in our lives. He is active in every part of our lives. We just don't see him. So when we say symbolically that, you know, God is not here or Yal Travai, that means that you can't see him. He is not a white man with a beard in the cloud. You know, he is in creation, you know, but he works through intercessors or intermediates itself or we can look at them as faces of God or different manifestations of him. Each and every one of us is imbued with uh, the qualities of God and each and every one of us as individuals is a manifestation of God. So whether it's a person who passed on, many say we, we speak of the law and these are nothing more than people who once lived, you know, who after they passed on they became deified as no no different than Catholic saints. It's just that in Hulu it is of people that passed on in Haiti or passed on in Africa that became uh, deified and pay homage to these people that actually lived. But in the same essence, we, as I said, we are all parts of this omnipotent, omnipresent reality itself. So, you know, this is Hulu. And from my uh, perspective. <laughs> Accordez-nous, <laughs> Uh, voodoo is not evil. Well, um, well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I can't speak for everyone, um, and it all depends on what a person calls evil. You know, um, 
if we see a guy or we see someone who beats their lover, you know, and then the person goes out to, you know, get some help, you know, to resolve their problem, you know, uh, is that person, you know, is the person who gives that person the justice they want evil, you know? I mean, for real, we have to take out situations, you know, these situations into consideration, you know? What do we call evil, you know? And what is evil, you know? I, I haven't found a definition of that, you know, uh, you know, a good definition of that word uh, as of yet, you know? So, evil, if you're talking about, you know, uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, work, spiritual work, destructive magic, you know, um, I would definitely say not every Voodoo Izan specializes in that. Some are just basically, that are in this tradition, are basically, uh, uh, they basically, well, not every Voodoo Izan does uh, magic, you know. There's a lot of them out here that don't know anything about it. You know, they're not magicians, they're not sorcerers, you know. Uh, there are some people that do specialize in it, like uh, especially myself. I do specialize in esoteric practices myself. Um, I would definitely say that not everyone out here actually does it, you know. Um, mainly what you'll find when you talk about BD, you have people that uh, practice it in a, uh, in a religious sense, you know, um, as well as a family tradition, you know. Before anything, that's what you mainly find. So to talk about everyone out here doing uh, uh, benevolent work, that is, that is uh, very misleading and, uh, you know, very, uh, I'd say, yeah, very misleading, you know, because, I mean, in the Western world, that's what we find. We find, a, you know, we say this, we say that. Even we find a lot of people, in, you know, that's in the church, they say this is demonic. But you ask yourself, you know, or the, the people, you ask the people that are claiming that this is evil, find most of the time is basically people who are of African descent. And you ask them, how do they gain Christianity? You know, they'll tell you that the Lord gave it to them, you know, but if we do history, we'll realize that the slave master gave them that book which we call the Bible, you know? So, with the practices that we have, you know, we can see that it is something that has been demonized from the beginning when we was taken out of, you know, when we were taken out of Africa. It doesn't matter anywhere, you know, anywhere where you anywhere that uh, Africans have went, you find the same scenario where their traditional practice were outlawed, banned, you know, demonized, and, you know, uh, and they were given uh, the good book, the Bible, you know? So, I mean, you know, that's just the way it is out here today, you know? So I don't really have too much to really argue about when it comes to whether a person wants to say that it is evil, whether it's not evil, I would just say this, you have a lot of people in the church, you know, robbing poor people of their money, you know, doing a lot of, you know, wicked things, you know, I mean, but you also find a lot of good people in the church doing good for the community, doing good for like uh, humanity in general, you know, so in every tradition that you go to, you're going to have people that are working on the aggressive side for the, or for their own interests, and you have people that were more up on the benevolent side that do things for you know for the great for a greater cause. So it is just not a principle, you know, if we're talking about this quote unquote term evil, it is not just something that is associated with evil. Anyone can be good or evil in their actions itself. So if we're talking about terminologies, then that's what I mean. So that's what I have to say. I was never initiated into it. It was something I was born into, you know? Uh, I, would, I can just think about when I was a child. There's many complications that arose in my, in, in my early development itself, you know? Many people thought I was gonna die at birth, you know? And even as a child, you know, I made it through and I'm here today, you know? Um, there's many things that I learned in the Western world that later on in my life I found in practices uh, of family members that were in this tradition. So I would say that it was something that I, that I wasn't taught. No one 
human, no human being actually taught me. It was, I feel, a divine intervention or a calling, as we may say in church, you know, that I was called to do this work, you know. Uh, everything was just placed in my way. Um, everything was here before I got here, laid down for me as in what I need to do. Everywhere I went, they gave me a piece, a piece that led me into one avenue, another avenue. So whether it was this, uh, uh, whether it was this Palero, whether it was this Sandro, you know, whether it was this Wunga, whether it was this Mongo, you know, so in the Western world, you can pretty much say that when I was, like, when I was uh, in, in, in America, my mother, you know, pretty much was there. I lived with my mother. And then pretty much what they did was they gave me the church, you know? And that's what I was brought up into. They never brought, they never, like, brought me up in a tradition to know about this. It's like something I think that my parents wanted me to keep me away from, you know? Um, but I don't know what their reason was for it, but I know they probably felt, felt for their best, you know, for the best for us. They didn't think maybe, uh, well, I say that they felt like probably it wasn't something that they wanted they wanted for us to get into. But, um, but as far as me, I found that I just was drawn to, you know, when I first started off, I didn't start off as, you know, researching voodoo as a tradition itself, you know. I didn't start off there. I started off with many things, you know. Again, it started off from basic tarot card readings, you know, from, you know, mind you, I didn't meet any uncles, I, you know, would like to speak about these things whatsoever, you know. Um, I may have talked with some uncles at the time when I was beginning my uh, journey, you know, but a lot of the stuff came from me via through different sources, and that's what kind of got me on a path, and when I got to a certain point, I said, you know what, I'm studying all this stuff and I'm learning and making these great experiences in these traditions like Goetia, Kabbalah, you know, uh, you know, transcendental yoga, you know, and I'm having all these great experiences and I said to myself, you know what, I have never turned back, you know, I have never researched or basically or Ifa, well, yeah, making all these great experiences with Ifa, uh, transcendental yoga, Kabbalah, Croatia, you know, I said to myself one day, you know, I'm Haitian, you know, there's so much of a taboo on Google, I mean, I'm into everything else, you know, and uh, I'm pretty good and grounded in a lot of these other traditions, so why is it that I'm not in, you know, why haven't I basically searched back into my tradition? So it led for me uh, researching and making my own experiences with what I knew from other traditions, that, you know, that I came across. And I started putting the pieces together, you know, putting the pieces together. Oh, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who is that guy? Who is that guy? So as time went on, I started doing things from how I arranged the altars, from what I heard from, like, you know, basic traditions of Ifa. You don't mix, uh, what, Shango and Ogun together. And then finding out that there's a concept like that, or in, in Voodoo, where you don't mix Ezeli Kweda and Ezeli don't talk together, you know. So it became something where I started seeing a, a commonality between these um, African-based traditions. And it was my base. And from there on, you know, uh, knowing that I had the ability to communicate with spirits itself, you know, it was as though they directed me in everything I need to do. You know, so when I came across my uncles and they would talk to me, they always asked me, "How did I uh, get into this? How did I like, uh, you know, how did I how did I come across this?" Because everything that I started doing myself was things that they were doing, you know, and it was like some, something that was like shocking to them because they never understood how is it that I just fell into it. You know, how did I just fall into this tradition? I was raised in a church. My father never really spoke to me about it. My mother never spoke to me about it. How did I just stumble upon this? I'm doing bebes, I'm, you know, communicating, I'm, you know, the Loa is basically, uh, you know, uh, mounting me, you know what I'm saying? So, it was something that, again, when you talk about it, I don't ever think that uh, it was something that uh, I, you know, we can say, to say uh, religious, you know, konzo. I never did that, you know? And I would definitely say from the amount of lives that I've actually helped, a lot of people I've actually helped, you know, there is uh, substantial evidence that, you know, my uh, um, coming into voodoo was authentic because it's not about what you say, it's about what you can do, you know? It's not about who initiates you, it's about what you can do, you know? So, my life bears witness, you know? Now, I, you know, I can say that I've connected with family. It's been a couple of years now since I've connected with family, and I am deeply entrenched 
into my culture, um, into my native, you know, tradition. So, this is what I have to say about that. Well, these are my final hours of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I hope you enjoyed this documentary. Thank you guys for watching.